Welcome to the lecture on regression. As I told you before, there are two dominant tasks in supervised machine learning. One is classification and one is regression. Um, these are the dominant tasks that we will consider in this data science lecture. As I said before, there's also other tasks, uh, unsupervised tasks that we're going to learn about. But the goal of regression is to predict real values, to predict a number, whereas the goal of classification is to put different instances into different classes. So that's the main difference with classification. We put things into a bucket, we make a binary decision, is malignant, is benign, and here we're trying to predict actual values. And one famous example for that is the prediction of housing prices. So the goal here, and this is a data set that you're going to work with, probably not that building because it belongs to MIT, but uh, uh, a data set with houses in Boston for which you're going to predict the price based on historical prices. So what we have here is we have different instances, different houses for which we know for how much they sold. And we know how many bedrooms they had. We know how big they were, how many square feet or square meters they had, and in which neighborhood they were located. And we, again, want to learn from data, from data from the past, to make predictions about the future in a fashion that generalizes. So we want to be able to give our model a number of bedrooms, a number of square feet, and a certain neighborhood to then make a prediction about the sale price. And what we're going to do in this lecture is, like with the classification lecture, consider different approaches. We will look at the so-called K and N, the K nearest neighbors approach, because I find that quite intuitive, because it's again very close to the data, it's just taking the data, and then we will also consider other modeling approaches where we try to more explicitly model the data and its distribution. So let's consider the k nearest neighbor. The, the target, the y-axis, would be the price of the house. And the feature could be the number of square meters. As we saw in the classification example, usually we have more than one dimension. But that's very un unintuitive. So here again, we have a simplification to just give you an intuition. And just like with the classification example, what we're doing here is for the green star, for the new uh, house that we have, we take the number of square meters, the feature on the x-axis, and then we try to find the training data point that is most closely related to this data point. And you can see that's the one close to, let's say, minus 1.8. And then we just take the price of that house as our estimate, as our regression estimate for the housing price of the unknown data point, the green star. And that makes our test prediction. As we saw before, we don't want to just take one neighbor into, into account because we get to better estimates if we combine different data points. So for instance, here we take three data points into account. And we already have a better estimate for a variety of them. If you Compare them. See here for the one on the very left, the green star, that's surprisingly low because, as you see, there's also other houses with less square meters that went for more. So, if we take the ones, the other two into account, we have a much better estimate. And here's an actual implementation. Here's actual code that you can run. And the first time we load the Boston data, again, that's the name of the data set, the Boston housing data. We take the train test split that you learned about in the exercise, and we take the mean squared error metric that I'm going to explain in a lot of detail in the next minutes, and we take the nearest neighbors regression model. So first we assign the variable Boston to the Boston data, and then we perform the train test split that you already know, learned about. So we take 66%, um, 67% for our training and 33% for our testing. And we split it into the X train and the X test. 
And then we have our model. And we take the k nearest neighbors regressor that I showed you conceptually now. And as you can see, it takes a parameter k, which is again the number of neighbors we want to take into account. And I'm doing that because I want to show you again what difference the parameter has and how it influences the predictions. First, let's consider the mean squared error function. That's what we're going to use to evaluate the model because we can't use accuracy here, right? Because accuracy would be true or false. And we can't really expect to predict the price of a house, the price of a real value so perfectly. So accuracy would work, perform terribly. So what we do here is really we just look at how far off we are. And again, the mean squared error is the metric that we're going to use. Here's an example on how to implement it in Python. Just a function that takes the y test, that is what we know, it's the testing data that we have, and the predictions from our model. And that's the x testing data that we give to the classifier, the CLF, uh, in our prediction. Let's consider the equation for the mean squared error. So this is the equation and it's quite simple. And I'm going to look at it step by step and highlighting all the steps as we go. So the first part is the error. And the error is really just how far off we are, right? We know what this house should cost and we know what we predicted for the house. So yi is the price of the house, y hat i is our prediction. And then we take the average over all the testing data points that we have, right? So we have this for loop and we go from one to n for all the data points and we collect the error and we do square that. Why do we square that? Because we don't want the different errors to cancel out, right? Maybe sometimes we're over predicting, we're saying the house is too uh, expensive. Maybe we say the house is too cheap and they could cancel out, which would enable us, which would uh, confuse us in our assessment. So we square it so to make them both positive numbers. And also we want small errors and to not be as problematic as large errors. And that's why we square the points. And again, that's the mean squared error. It's one important uh, evaluation metric in regression. And we're going to use this now to again look at the influence that the k as a hyperparameter is something that we decide while modeling has on the predictions of our machine learning model. So we just have this for loop in which we consider the range of k's going from 1 to 10. And for each of the k's, we initialize a classifier with the k. Then we train the model using the fit function of the scikit-learn library. And then we print the k as well as the mean squared error um, based on the testing data that we know and our prediction for the testing data. And you can see that well, for the k1, the mean squared error is 44. That's like how far off we are for the housing prices. It changes a bit, it goes lower, and then it increases again. And we can plot this quite nicely and we see that for the Boston housing data that we have here, that the lowest mean squared error, and that's what we want. We want the error to be low here in this particular case. Accuracy, we always want to be high, close to 100. Here we want to be as close as zero as possible. And we can see that the smallest value that we find is for k equals 3. As I said, we have different ways of modeling this, as we always have different modeling ways in machine learning. And what I showed you now is to do it on a k nearest neighbors basis. What we're looking at now is to model it more explicitly. And what we're doing here is we introduce a bunch of parameters um, for our model. And this is similar to the line fitting problem that we considered for the classification example. So we have our input data 
And we just want to find values that we can compute against this input data to make a good final price estimate. And for that, we're going to, again, fit a line, very similar to what we've done before, uh, in a model called linear regression. And the goal here is, again, to find an intercept, an offset, uh, on the y-axis, and a slope, a w, and to fit that best to the data in a way that makes predictions with the least error. Here's the Python implementation for that. There's the scikit-learn.linear underscore model, and we can import the linear regression from there, and we can fit this based on our training data to have a machine learning model like we've done before. And then we can use this classifier, the CLF, to predict on our testing data. And what you can see here is that we have quite a low um, error as compared also to the other model that we considered. And that's how well we generalize on this particular data set with making predictions about housing prices. In scikit-learn, we can look at the different coefficients, the parameters, and we can also look at the intercept. That's the constant feature. That's where our line starts. And again, this is just describing a line, right? That's the offset of the line. That's the intercept and the coefficients of, uh, and the slope of the line, which is in the coefficients. And it's just numbers that we compute against our input data to make a prediction. And that's it for artificial intelligence, right? No, this is really all you need for making predictions in this setting and neural networks are a bit more involved, have a bit more clever engineering, but it's not fundamentally different from what we're seeing here. Here again is a visualization of all the data points that we have and the line that we fit. And we see that there's an error for almost every data point, right? So we're almost never perfect, but uh, the error is always the difference between an individual data point like the red cross that we looked at there, and the blue line, and it's the blue, the fitted line. But let's look a bit more about this error function, because it's very good at understanding the fundamental principles behind machine learning. And again, this is just the mean squared error. Again, this is with the formula filled in. This is the error function that we consider. That's the mean squared error. And we have the true y, that's the y hat. And we have the y that we compute, that we predict with our model. And we take that squared as described. And we take that for all the data points. We take the mean squared error, right? We take the difference between the, date, the data point that we know. We know the price of the house and our prediction of the price of the house. So we can, instead of yi, also write the formula of our linear regression, and that is w times x, that's the parameters, the coefficients, times the x values, plus the intercept, plus the b, sometimes also called bias, called the intercept here. And again, this is our formula for the line, the w x1 xi plus b, and we subtract that from the true value, the price of the house that we know. We take that squared again for the reasons I explained and do that for all the data points. And that's our error function, sometimes also called loss function. That's why it has an L there. And our goal is to minimize the second equation. We want a model with the smallest possible mean squared error. And what we're doing for that is we're taking a gradient. And you might remember that from school or from your university classes but I'm just giving you a quick update on what the gradient is and how it works. So just imagine a car, and you know that a car has acceleration, right? Let's say there's a function a for the acceleration in uh, relation to t, and it's two meters per over seconds squared. That's like uh, how much we accelerate, and this is like how much faster or slower it goes. So the acceleration is changing our velocity which is the speed with which we're traveling. And the velocity we define here as v in respect to t as the acceleration times the time. So that's two times t. 
And that velocity is then changing our distance traveled, right? That's the, um, that's the way we're moving. And that distance traveled uh, is defined as uh, a over 2 times t2. And what this is basically meant to show you is just how they relate, right? If I accelerate my car, I increase my speed, I increase my velocity, and then I change my position faster. So they're all related in this way that they're all influencing each other, right? So the, the velocity is the first derivative of the distance traveled, and the acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity, which means that the acceleration is the second derivative of the distance traveled. And I'm bringing this up because what's really, really cool and very helpful for all these machine learning techniques is that we can take the derivative of our loss functions. And again, the cool thing is that we can take this derivative for any function. So here, again, it's the derivative, it's the relative change and we have, that, we have, uh, that we can compute for different functions. And what we're going to do, and what's really, really cool and quite groundbreaking, is that we can take this for the loss function, right? So we have a function with which we measure how well we can make predictions about housing prices, and we can take the derivative of that, and that means that we know in which direction we need to move to minimize the function. And that's what we're showing here in the figure, right? So here, for instance, it's increasing, it's increasing. But we know if we go down that row, then the derivative here, right, and the local optimum here is what we're looking for, is where the function is the smallest. And that's exactly what, we're, what we want to. And the derivative basically helps us to change the parameters so that we go towards um, a local optimum. And there's different ways of computing this. For linear regression, you might know the closed form solution. But again, that doesn't scale, especially for more complex models. So we're going to use something called gradient descent. And the basic idea here is to use the gradient, is to use the derivative to update the model parameters, which we called W and B, until a minimum is found. And we know that the convergence to the global minimum is guaranteed for convex functions with some reservations. Again, the global minimum is where the gradient is zero. And here's our loss function that we can then derive. And we do this practically in two ways. We do this in respect to our parameters w, and we do this in respect to our bias. You know these equations by now. So what we're doing here is we look at the partial derivatives of our loss function. And again, this is the loss function as we know it. So we have a partial derivative in respect to the parameter w and a partial derivative in respect to the loss function. And don't be too shy if you want to repeat the rules of partial derivatives. Have a look at them. you find a lot of good online resources. So pause the video and do that now. Because what we're doing here is that we take this partial derivative and that's the direction in which we know that we lower our parameters and we make small changes to our parameters to go towards the optimum, right? So we know in which direction the loss function is moving and we want it to be smaller. So we're taking steps in respect to the derivative so that we optimize our parameters. So here we, for the w, we have this rule in which we change the current w in respect to the partial derivative of the loss function in respect to w. And for the b, we do that as well. You see that there is also a parameter alpha. Because we don't just want to reset the values, we want to make small steps towards it. And the reason for that is that we only have so many data points and we don't know how representative each of the data points is for the things that we're trying to optimize. So 
we're not just resetting it based on the derivative, but we're making small changes because we're only looking at a bunch of data points at a time. And we hope that over time we will optimize and become an optimal, get an opt optimal solution here. So here again are the things that we're looking at. The W is the coefficient and the slope, and the B is the intercept. And the alpha is what's called the learning weight. So we're changing our parameters in respect to the partial derivative of the loss function. And again, because we can compute for the loss function in which direction it will be lower and in which direction it will be higher, we want it to be lower. So we take these changes to the parameters to make it lower based on the partial derivative. And the learning rate is quite important. It's always between zero and one, and it's basically how many changes we do at a particular time step. If it's too high, you might risk overshooting, as you can see illustrated here, right? So in the first steps, we're making steps, we're stepping towards the local optimum, and that would be our loss function with the least amount of errors for the model that we have. But at the end, you can see that there's actually a much better solution, but because our learning rate is too high, we're overshooting, we're jumping back and forth. And there's a lot of research on this, on finding out which is the best uh, learning rate, um, but it's a challenging problem, especially with neural networks still. So here again, a more abstract view on the math that I just showed you, I hope it didn't scare you off. Um, so we have the gradient descent. So we evaluate the gradients, that is taking the partial derivative, and then we're updating our parameters so that we minimize the objective. And we have a stopping criteria, because in the end, when in reality, there will always be some changes. So what we're doing is we're doing this steps, right, taking our partial derivatives um, and changing the parameters until the changes are very, very small until we're only really changing, doing like minimal changes. And based on that, we have a stopping criteria, which is basically just the number at which we say, okay, the changes are so small that we don't consider them uh, useful anymore. And we stop our search for the best parameters here. And here's a real implementation of this in Python code. So we take NumPy, we take a bunch of numbers, in a linear space between one and 10, 100 numbers here, and we take the sine, the sine function, and combine it with uh, a power function and some randomness to just get a bunch of data. And then we normalize it, and this is basically what we got. It's just a bunch of data that we generated ourselves, right? some x values based on the values from zero to, uh, to one, and uh, some y data based uh, on the sign and power combination. And what we're trying to do is to fit a function here based on the code that I showed you. And I'm going to show you Python code because I know for programmers, it's often easier to just look at code than to look at math equations. We do one little trick. Up until now, we had the W and the bias and we combine them into one. So the idea is to simplify our model. Um, so we take the intercept and include it into the input values. So in this way, we don't have to carry the bias B term through the calculation. And that's done by adding a column of ones to the data. And in this way, the model becomes simpler, becomes just Y equals W transposed times X. And then we shuffle and segment the data. And this is the train test split that you've seen before but spelled out for you. So what we take here is we do a random permutation of the data, um, which is just a random sorting. And then we take 20% of the 100 data points in this example for our testing set and 80% for our training set. And we again assign train X, train Y, test X, and test Y. And then we have this implementation of the gradient. And as I said, it's really just the functions that you already know. So we have our loss function, which really just comes down to the mean squared error. That's the difference between 
our linear model and the true values that we know. Yeah, so in the first step, we compute the y estimate, that is taking our values, the x, the, 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 the information the attributes about the data, times our parameters. And when we compute the error, that is how far off are we for the individual data points. And we do this in matrices. So that's why it looks so simple. That's why it's just one line. But keep in mind that it's really just the, um, the matrix in the background. So that's basically the sum uh, just expressed as a matrix. And then we compute the gradient. And again, it's just based on the equation we have there. Uh, and so we have our gradient that is the derivative in respect to our loss function. Also notice that since we'll be multiplying it by the learning weight, we don't actually have to multiply by 2, right? It's just a scaling factor, the 2, so that's why we leave it out. Also notice how the implementation makes no use of for loops. Um, we do everything as matrix multiplication which promotes a lot of great speedups. It's much, much faster. In fact, when using math libraries like NumPy, you should always try to produce good vectorized code since their functions are optimized to perform matrix multiplications. You can look up BLAS, B-L-A-S, to understand how this works technically, but it's very, very fast. So let's consider the whole thing. So what we're doing here is we initialize our weight matrix W with random values. And then we have our tolerance, which again is the stopping criteria that I referred to before. And we have our learning rate, which we set to 0 0.5. And then we have this loop. And inside the loop, we calculate the gradient and the error for our current model, and then update the weight matrix. We then check if the sum of the absolute differences between the new and the old values is bigger than our tolerance, it's our stopping criteria, uh, or in other words, if our model changed significantly, and if it does, we stop, we say, okay, we get out of this while loop, we found our parameters. Other than that, for each iteration, we compute the error, we see how well our per uh, performance is, and we print that out, and we do this again and again, and then reassign the parameters. So yeah, these are, let's say, the most important parts, and I just keep them here so that you can look at our uh, model while it learns. So we're really looking at this step by step. So we initialize the parameters randomly, and then we optimize it, and this is how it works. So it's really impressive how well we can learn from our errors and that we can learn the parameters and optimize our parameters based on the derivative of our error function. And in a way, we saw this now with a very simple model, with a linear regression model, but we can do this with all other kinds of models. And this is really core to, for instance, how neural networks with millions of neurons and, and many, many different layers, especially in deep learning, learn. It's the same idea, um, just um, with a bit more clever engineering around it. Yeah, and that's our result. And here we uh, colored in the training and test sets in different colors. So blue is the training data, red is the testing data, and then we have our fitted model. And as you can see, we have a linear model, but we have assigned data, so it won't perfectly fit it. But this was just a training example, 